Hey y'all, welcome to the channel. Today we're checking out why you won't survive British Special Forces training. I mean, I could tell you a lot of reasons why, but let's see what they say. The Special Air Service, Britain's original Special Forces, and the granddaddy of all modern Special Forces. The SAS is the benchmark by which every other Special Forces unit is measured, <laughs> and their tactics and training methods have been replicated all over the world. Many apply each year to join this legendary service, and many fail and are washed out of training. What about you, though? Think you've got <laughs> what it takes to join the elite SAS? Uh, no. SAS selection takes place across several phases of selection, with selection phase one, known as endurance, taking place over three grueling weeks. For phase one, okay. you'll head out to the countryside in South Wales, but don't expect a picnic, because you'll immediately be put to marching across varying routes. Initially, you'll carry a pack loaded up with the essential gear, such as a rain poncho, sleeping bag, first aid kit, and distress flares. Okay. I can walk. How much weight are we talking? Though you can expect that as the distance you're forced to march increases, so does the weight. You'll okay. carry your food with you too, which consists of some bread rolls, a few Mars candy bars, and potato chips, along with a 24-hour ration pack that can only be opened in an emergency. Two Mars bars, potato chips, bread rolls, and a ration pack. There's a lot of air in a bread roll, so it doesn't seem like the best choice. Chips are totally unhealthy. That must just be for calories. Maybe that's why the Mars bars too. It's it's still a weird combination. Like why those things? Why not a turkey sandwich or four ration packs? There must be some sort of mental test. There's probably some strategy mixed in with what foods you eat first and when you eat them maybe. Forced to march endlessly, low on food and sleep, this phase isn't just testing your physical fitness, but your mental fitness as well. Unlike in most other Special Forces candidate programs, here you won't have to deal with instructors screaming at you and breathing down your neck. Instead, SAS instructors purposefully leave you completely to your own devices, offering wow. no encouragement, but no chastisement either. <laughs> you will pass or fail completely of your own volition. Huh. That's kind of zen, isn't it? We're going to put you out in the woods. With these few things, good luck, or not even good luck. They won't even say good luck. And you better be good at disciplining temptation too, because while you may be starving, opening up that 24-hour emergency ration pack without permission is grounds for rejection. Attention to detail ah. is critical for an SAS soldier. So as long as you're trying to drag yourself through another day-long march on your blistered feet, you should expect instructors to occasionally quiz you about landmarks you may have just passed. The purpose is to test your alertness and see how well you can pay attention while physically miserable. One candidate said he was asked how many supports were on a bridge he had just crossed over during his march. Eventually, you'll face the final test, yeah. a grueling 40-mile march wow. up and down hills, carrying 55 pounds of gear and an assault rifle to boot. Hang on. Not only will 40 miles? 40 miles in 22 hours. Okay. No. Torture. 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 Not only are you walking 40 miles, you're carrying 55 pounds of gear and a rifle. I don't know if I've ever held an assault rifle, but they look heavy. That seems impossible. I would not survive. Not to mention staying awake for 22 hours. Not only will you have to accurately navigate your own course, but you'll only have 22 hours to complete the course. Failure means your application process is over I and fail. you'll return to your home unit. Just because you pass, though, don't expect that you're on to the next official phase because instructors will have been carefully evaluating you the entire time. If they suspect you aren't the right stuff, it won't matter how fast you completed your course or how much weight you can carry. You'll be rejected and sent back to your home unit. Out of 200 candidates, only around 30 to 40 will make it past this phase yeah, I and wouldn't. move on to the next phase, jungle training. Oh, like geez. most of SAS's training, the exact details of what goes on in the jungle phase are classified. What is known, though, is that trainees will learn jungle survival skills, as well as how to conduct patrols deep behind enemy lines and live off the land for weeks at a time. Oh, you know they're wrestling alligators in the jungle. If you go in the jungle, you're going to encounter an alligator. Hell, if you go onto a golf course in South Florida, you're going to you're going to encounter an alligator and live off the land for weeks at a time. Weeks at a time, in the jungle by yourself, without any food, just eating whatever you find in the jungle? I, w I would not survive. I would not survive. I wouldn't make it past phase one. How to conduct patrols deep behind enemy lines and live off the land for weeks at a time. 
Trainees will learn how to operate as a four-man unit and live on rations, remaining undetected as they carry out their mission. A strong emphasis on physical fitness will also see trainees hit the gym every day, and after the gym there will be a great deal of time spent out on the ranch. There you'll learn how to operate standard bits of SAS gear, That'd to be include fun. battle rifles, recoilless rifles, grenade launchers, and light machine guns. That would Trainees be cool. will also learn how to operate many other weapons in use across the world. An SAS soldier must know how to pick up a weapon in a foreign battlefield and use it effectively if he needs to. I never would have thought of that. So not only do they have to learn how to use all the SAS weapons and gear, they have to learn how to use the weapons and gear of... You'll also undergo training on setting up ambushes as well as responding to enemy ambushes. That would be You'll cool. be trained in advanced scouting techniques and how to observe your environment for subtle changes that could signal a hidden enemy patrol or a sniper perched that and waiting, detecting changes in color, shadows, or even small movements. How do they know when there's a sniper somewhere? I wonder what the technique is. As with many other Special Forces training programs, you'll also learn advanced defensive driving techniques, enabling a quick getaway hell in any yeah. hostile situation. Oh, These are hell many yeah. of the same techniques that police use for stopping speeding drivers, but you'll learn how to avoid those same techniques and not be stopped yourself. That would be so fun. Learning, <laughs> learning how to... Uh, Evade the cops. We hope you like blowing things up because you'll also be learning how to handle a variety of explosives. Fun. And because explosions typically mean wounded, you'll receive extensive medical training that can be quickly deployed out in the field. One of the most important jobs that special forces operators do in war is reconnaissance. And so you'll learn how to establish listening posts and observation posts and covertly observe an enemy. To aid you in your mission, you'll learn how to use a variety of secure communications gear, such as satellite radios, and how to avoid getting pinned down by the enemy due to your electronic emissions. Lastly, you'll undergo extensive hand-to-hand -hand and close-quarters combat techniques, and become mm -hmm. an expert in breaching and assaulting enemy structures. To make it to the end of this phase, you'll be amongst the 15 to 20 who didn't get sick from the jungle environment and drop out, or weren't washed out by instructors. Don't start congratulating yourself yet though, because the ultimate test is coming up next. Part 1 of your final test is a 3-day escape and evasion course. You'll be given a ratty old coat, boots that may be held together with only strings, and no food or water. You'll have a short head start and must evade capture for 3 days by a hunter force equipped with dogs and modern equipment. Oh Ready? my god! They hunt you down like an animal. That's kind of brilliant though. A lot of these things that they're calling training seems to actually be more like a test to see what you can do automatically, naturally. I think the training on the like the weapons and the driving would be really fun and interesting, but these physical tests would be absolute torture. And this this last one being hunted down, even if you know that it's part of the training, I think it would still mess with your head. It would be terrifying to know that there are dogs coming after you. For these three days, you must live off the land while abating your pursuers. And though officially you're barred from entering any structures, some crafty trainees may sneak their way into a civilian property and maybe even have a local take them in. Smart. As with most special forces tests, cheating is simply another creative way of accomplishing the required objective, as long as you aren't hot, that is. The second part of your final test will take place when you're captured or at the end of the three days. If you've managed to avoid capture, then you'll be expected to return <laughs> to a designated location at the end of the third day. Once there, you'll be handcuffed, have a bag thrown over your head, and be taken to a remote location. Instructors will then attempt to break you down mentally. You'll be placed in stress positions and forced to hold them for hours at a time. Ugh. You may be locked in a cage the size of a dog kennel, while instructors bash the roof of it with chains. Instructors will strip you nude in front of female instructors who will mock the size of your manhood. It's <laughs> all a mental game, meant to soften you up for the ending interrogation session. That is messed up. So even if you make it past those three days of not being captured by the dogs, they're going to put a bag over your head put you in a cage, make you naked, and have women make fun of your penis. This is really, they're, they're taking it to another level with the penis mocking. No matter how well endowed you are, it could get to your head. 
It's all a mental game, meant to soften you up for the pending interrogation session. After enough humiliation and mental torture, you'll be thrown into a room with an interrogator and your job will be to only reveal the big four to him or her. Your name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. Giving the interrogator mm. any information other than that will lead to your immediate expulsion from SAS training. But if you know that going in, surely the interrogators use tactics like, say, the training's over, you made it, congratulations, now tell us something other than those four things. That's it, the end of the line for you. If you make it through this final phase, then you can feel proud of accomplishing what very few people have ever done. You'll receive the Beige Beret with the Winged Dagger Insignia and officially become a member of the British Special Air Service. However, maybe celebrate modestly because you'll be on probation <laughs> until you finish your continuation training and sadly, many soldiers are returned to their home unit during this phase. If that happens to you, you'll at least have worn the beret for a short time and that's an accomplishment in and of itself. Wait, what? If they you send you home? Badly, celebrate modestly because you'll be on probation until you finish your continuation training and sadly, many soldiers are returned to their home unit during this phase. If that oh. happens to you, you'll at least have worn the beret for a short time, and that's an accomplishment in and of itself. If you make it through training though, you'll join the 22nd Special Air Service Regiment, which consists of four active squadrons, A, B, D, and G. Each squadron is made up of around 60 men. A, B, D, and G? Is this just another tactic to mess with your head? Meaning there's roughly 240 active duty SAS oh. soldiers at a time. In the I, I didn't realize how elite it was, but that's... Only 240. I mean, you'll probably do a lot of damage with 240 SAS members, for sure, but... With two reserve regiments, the 21st and 23rd SAS. This is in sharp contrast to the approximately 2,000 Navy SEALs the U.S. military has, right. but that's due to the smaller size of the British military. Amongst each SAS squadron are four troops, and each troop specializes in a different area of expertise. The air troop is specialized in parachute insertions, including static line insertions and halo jumps deep behind enemy lines. Cool. The boat troop is specialized in amphibious operations, such as inserting into hostile beaches via submarines, a cool. favorite tactic of U.S. SEALs. Interestingly, SAS and American SEALs work so closely together that often SAS soldiers will deploy from an American submarine specially outfitted to deliver special forces under the cover of the waves. Nice. Mobili we got your back, SAS. Mobility troop soldiers specialize in handling any number of vehicles. You can think of them as the getaway drivers of the SAS. Mm. Mountain troops are trained in Arctic warfare and navigating and surviving in dangerous mountainous terrain. SAS mountain troops work closely with American and French special forces in the mountain regions of Afghanistan, hunting down Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters in deep mountain complexes. Nice. The close-knit relationship between SAS and American special forces means that both nations share many of the same tactics and training techniques, Sweet. and an SAS soldier is always welcome aboard any American aircraft or boat. If you had joined the SAS in the early 2000s, you may have been a part of the legendary Task Force 88, easily the deadliest fighting force ever assembled on planet Earth. Immediately after Saddam Hussein's government was ousted from power, Task Force 88 was formed to hunt down the former dictator and his supporters. And over the years, their job evolved to becoming the premier hunter-killers of NATO's war against terrorist leaders in Iraq and Afghanistan. Most mm. of their deeds are shrouded in extreme secrecy. Though it's known that TF-88 was responsible for killing one of the key members of the insurgency, Al Zarqawi. At its height, Task Force that. 88 was made up of Task Force Black, an SAS Sabre Squadron supported by specialist boat service operators. Task Force Blue was made up of the legendary SEAL Team 6. Task yeah. Force Green was made up of operatives from America's Delta Force. Yeah. And Task Force Orange was made up of the single most secretive special forces operators in the world, America's Intelligence Support Activity. A special forces unit what? whose job is to find actionable intelligence for other special forces units and which the Pentagon denies any official knowledge of. Yeah, I've never heard of that. I didn't know we had that. I guess that's a good thing. They want to stay secret, right? I shouldn't know about it. And now, whoever made this video is probably dead. Task Force 88 was an example of the close-knit relationship between the Special Air Service and its American counterparts. And that relationship continues to this day in unacknowledged conflicts all around the world. If you think you've got what it takes to make it through SAS selection after watching our video, no. maybe you too will be working side by side with the world's best, hunting down bad guys in jungles, deserts, and mountains all over the globe. You don't want me now doing that. Now that you've watched this adrenaline-packed video, maybe it's time to chill out. Wow, I didn't know. So just to recap, I think I could survive being stripped naked and women making fun of my penis 
and I think I could survive the weapons and driving training, but any of the endurance stuff? Hell no. Not only would I be kicked out of the SAS, I, I would probably die. When I was growing up, I lived across the street from this guy who was a Navy SEAL, and he said that in training, they taught him how to hide behind something as small as a vase, like about like a basketball, by using the shadows and however else, like positioning his body in a certain way, he could hide behind that thing. Wow, I have a lot more respect for the SAS now that I've seen this. I didn't really even know what it was before. I didn't even know what SAS stood for. But now when I see somebody wearing that beret, props to you, person. Eye-opening video. Thank y'all for recommending. Thank y'all for watching. And I'll see you next time. Later.